Um, his name is Mr. Mpuluki Lerumo Mohobe, and um, he's going to share a little bit about his profile with us and all the many things that he's doing. He's a lawyer, he's into real estate development. Um, you might have gotten into one of his restaurants just recently in the CBD. Um, he's also got, I think, businesses, I believe, in the, the Kasani Maung area. So we're going to be having a chat about that. He's also into speaking. And I'm a firm believer that uh, you don't just wake up and uh, become accomplished in whatever career path you take or start and grow business. Um, I think the personal development aspect is very important. The spiritual aspect is very important. So I'm going to start it from there on a soft on a, on a soft um, <laughs> note uh, because I do know that he also has a speaking business uh, which is called Speaks Volumes. Uh, Mr. Mkobi, welcome to Venture In. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing fantastic. Thank mm -hmm. you for the privilege and the honor of uh, being your guest. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Or oh, are much. you still working? Well, <laughs> work and play for me are one and the same. Okay. <laughs> yes. Has that always been the case? More or less. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah. At least uh, as far as I can recall, I've, uh, I've made it a point that I enjoy my work and uh, you know, I do have fun, as much fun as I can while I'm working. Okay, yeah. great. Tell us a little bit about uh, Speaks Volumes. Um, I, I do see here that you know you focus a lot around personal development, transformation, yeah. paradigm shifting. In the, what is that? In the mid-zeros, uh, around 2003-2004, I decided to learn a bit more about speaking. Uh, the idea was to enhance my capabilities as a, an advocate, as an attorney, so that when I argue a case, I could, um, you know, have that slight little extra edge. But what then happened is that I fell in love with speaking. I went to the point of uh, becoming a member of NSASA, which is uh, National Speakers Association of Southern Africa. And, uh, but since I was um, involved in the running of the law firm at the time, uh, the Roman of Legal Practitioners, and I was also preoccupied with setting up my uh, real estate business. I did not uh, focus too much on speaking. However, the one thing that I did through Speaks Volumes, I set up Meet the Overcomers, which as you know is currently in the hands of Mr. Repton Majani. Mm -hmm. And it is a show that uh, airs every Wednesday at 6 p.m. So that was uh, my, my foray, as it were, into speaking. But over time, I've realized the importance of speaking the importance of public speaking. Not only do you have to speak to uh, communicate your ideas to your staff, especially when the staff is large. You presently have uh, upwards of 160 people mm. and, uh, in our various companies. So when the numbers become large, you have to speak with um, bigger you know, numbers of people. So the skills we've uh, cultivated in speaking come to come to our aid in terms of communication and so on. So what I then realized is that, look, I like the speaking idea. So why don't I uh, professionalize it again? Why don't I monetize it? So I'm um, at a point where I'm actually having my first official paid gig uh, on, uh, on my birthday, which is on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm excited and looking forward to it. I'm hoping that come 2020, I'll be able to avail myself to speak and then I'll be able to share what I call experiential knowledge in terms of the knowledge that I've accumulated as an investor, as an entrepreneur, as a, as a lawyer over the years. Then I'll be able to speak from a position of strength where I'm able to tell people I was able to do X, Y, and Z by applying these skills. I won't just be calling myself a motivational speaker with nothing to show for it. Mm. Let's start. Let's start with yes. your experiential knowledge here yes, yes. on venture. And for some of uh, the individuals who might not be able um, to attend, I see there in your profile there's something that says paradigm shift. Yeah. Before we speak about your exper ex experiences in entrepreneurship, talk a little bit about that um, and, yeah. and link it to my intro, where we have the, uh, the whole idea of, of paradigm shifting is based on the notion that you cannot, um, you cannot achieve or you cannot solve your problems with the same thinking that landed into your problems. I think this was something that was said by Einstein and the whole idea that you have to become a new you to improve. In other words, it's more about changing yourself 
for your circumstances to change, you have to change your circumstances. So it's a question of uh, personal development. So changing your paradigm. Paradigm simply, simply means a way of looking at things, a way of uh, viewing uh, circumstances. So I've noticed and I've realized over the years that our biggest challenges, including for myself, relate to uh, the way that we look at things. So unless our paradigm changes, unless it shifts, sometimes your results will remain the same. Mm. There's usually a cost to your journey. Um, and I don't think that Meet the Overcomers uh, was by a coincidence. Maybe share just one example of one of those things that you know you've overcome in relation to business mm -hmm. that you think you know really developed you and your tenacity and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think um you know, how much time do you have? I mean, there are so many examples. We have time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we have time. Uh, the, I mean, the, from a, my experience in as, as an entrepreneur, um, it used to devastate me beyond measure when my loan applications were rejected. I remember when I first started, um, I approached a bank manager, I won't mention his name, at uh, African Mall, and I was looking for a paltry amount of 1,500 pula. And that chap literally laughed me off, uh, laughed me off the, the, the bank saying, you know, you know I, I didn't have my ducks in a row, I didn't know what I was talking about, and he couldn't give me a loan for 1500 Now, that experience um, it taught me that, look, you have to take the good and the bad the same way. I mean, you have to get used to the idea of no. You have to get to used to the idea of negative criticism, the idea of rejection know that success can only come when you, uh, you repeatedly face rejection. So rejection is a necessary part of success. So that's what I've come to accept um, over my life. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about mentorship. Um, mm. You and I have engaged before on different platforms. Earlier this year we were at the Youth Alive Seminar mm -hmm. and um, we had a one-on-one -on -one conversation and I remember you sharing your thoughts there, you know, Mr. Muni actually mentored you, you yes. know, and, and it was an amazing thing to see that you're the fruit of somebody else's yeah. mentorship. Um, walk us through that journey. I'll he, just... me he mentored me without us being formalistic about it. Okay. I just kept going to him and bombarding him with questions, mm. raising this question, asking this, and the same with uh, the owner of your radio station, Mr. Jamali. I kept going to them and Nare Mahang, and Semele Mahang uh, of uh, those three come to mind as so far as mentorship is concerned. Mm -hmm. But after our engagement that you've just made reference to, I thought to myself, uh, what is the best way to have a larger impact on this mentorship thing? Mm -hmm. So I came up with the idea of uh, setting up a, a program. I call it a podcast. I call it Mohobe's Nuggets of Wisdom Podcast. And if your listeners have access to Wi-Fi, I would urge them to, uh, to, to, to press, uh, to type, Mokobe um, Nuggets of Wisdom, and they will see there that uh, among the many nuggets I deal with, I deal with the question of um, mentorship. What I've come to realize is that I'm not able to mentor the number of people that are approaching me for mentorship because there are so many. I get an average of one or two a day asking for some form of mentorship. So therein, <clears throat> I spell out in one of the nuggets, the top ten nuggets of wisdom for securing the services of a mentor. I call it services, but I mean, I said, having access to, to a mentor. The point I'm making is that you need mentorship, you know. Uh, mentorship um, has to be a conscious and deliberate effort on the part of the uh, would-be entrepreneur. Mentorship will, may come from books. Mentorship may come from absorbing content. But obviously, uh, the best type of mentorship, in addition to these two, is have someone who, on, on whom you can bounce off ideas and test your concepts and see how they've gotten where they are. And I have I had the good fortune of having, having these three gentlemen, all of whom are, are still alive, who mentored me and who really helped me uh, in my entrepreneurial journey. Mm. What role has your spirituality played in all this? How important has it been? I mean, I'm the guy who had the benefit of a mother who dragged me to church kicking and screaming as a child. And i fallen in love with the idea of um, spending at least a day out of seven uh, interacting 
and thinking about and meditating upon a higher power. I find that it helps me in terms of getting me centered, in terms of helping me, uh, getting me anchored, in terms of uh, uh, ensuring that I'm, 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 what is the right word? Um, I think anchored is the right word. Mm. You know, so 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 you know my 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 faith, which is uh, my Christian faith, as a Seventh Day Adventist practitioner, has been pivotal in my judgment. In so far as I've come to realize some of the the ideas that come from uh, that come into entrepreneurship actually come from Christianity. I, for instance, have discovered that one of the most powerful uh, entrepreneurial books are contained in the Bible. In fact, two, the book of uh, Proverbs mm-hmm. and the book of Ecclesiastes. Those two books, if you take all the entrepreneurial ideas, all the personal development ideas, and you, you, you narrow them to their core, you find that they are, they are biblical in origin and they can be found in one of those books, in my judgment. You've got two minutes before you go for a break. Let's yes. talk about multi-generational um, wealth. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm listening to you, and your son is here taping you for your podcast. Yes. Um, uh, what sort of approach are you taking to say, I want to transfer my knowledge, and I, I, I want to be able to build my, my, my sons or my daughter uh, to be able to take over everything that I'm building? What I recognize is, uh, is that, as we say in Sichuan, I'm what I recognize clearly is that it's up to these individuals that I have uh, brought to this earth. I mean, I have two sons and two daughters. It's up to them individually what they learn from me. But what I've decided is to avail myself to them. If they ask me a question, I'll do my best to either answer that question or to make it possible to find an answer to that question. Mm-hmm. I try to expose them to business. I expose them. One of them, some of them, I tried to interest in law, and all four of them rejected <laughs> rejected the law, the and legal profession. But they seem two of them seem to be uh, vaguely interested in in business, and the last one seems to be also interested in in, in, the, in, in the restaurant business because she likes cooking and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. So you keep your fingers crossed. You don't know what the future holds, but you hope that um, over time. Uh, as as things develop, they will get involved in the, in, the, in the family business, and they will take it to greater heights than you've been able to take it. It's just a hope and a wish, but I I, I realize that it's not entirely up to me. It's up to external forces. It's up to God, for instance. But I'll do the little that I can to try and influence them positively into being interested in the businesses that I'm involved in. Mm. I'm going to go for a quick break and when we come back um, we'll continue the conversation. If you've just joined us, I was speaking to Mr. Mbuliki Lirumo Mbobe. He's a lawyer and an entrepreneur amongst many things, operating in, uh, in the stock markets, operating in property, uh, operating in, 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 in the hospitality space. So we're going to have a quick break. And when we come back and continue the conversation, I'm going to try and get a little bit more technical now and talk about, you know, how he started and, you know, the systems he put in, in place uh, to be able to expand his business. And I'm aware that he's currently under growth uh, strategy and expanding his business as we speak. So do stick around for that. Our time is uh, 6.30. And if you've just joined us, we're having a conversation with uh, Mr. Mumpuluki, the Rumo Mokode. Uh, he's talked to him under, under the capacity as uh, one of the seasoned entrepreneurs um, in the country, and really just to mellow the content down. We started the first half, a little bit of spiritual insight and, and a little bit about his philosophy, a little bit about uh, building multi-generational wealth in the family. And I'm now going to get into, and I'm going to do this calmly, into all the various businesses that he has. And my objective over the next 20 minutes is to touch on two things, um, corporate governance in his business. I've heard a lot about this uh, around how it's the key to actually expanding your business, but it, it remains one of the key challenges um, we have in the country in business. And then also talk a little bit about um, his portfolio, which one was the cash cow, which one fed, which one, uh, which one started first, and etc. So start off with his portfolio. He's also got business. We started with the speaking business, but he's now um, he also has um, a property, and, um, and out of the property, he's got Mohobi Incorporated, uh, Simolemo, uh, Pty Ltd, Pressure Made Holdings, and all these are real estate development and management companies. And uh, collectively, uh, he has valued them uh, to about uh, 
is a multi-million pula uh, portfolio. And he's also got restaurants um, and Mohobi Incorporated, as well as Nona's and Center Square. And um, this is, uh, I think, two restaurants, two franchise restaurants in the heart of CBD at the um, Mohobi Plaza. And um, he's also got a branded restaurant by the name of Nona's uh, Italian Kitchen and Black Lounge. Um, I'm sure you've passed by it mm. uh, recently. And also, he's also got a legal practice uh, called Yurumo Mohobi, uh, legal practitioners and um, seen as one of the large indigenous law firms in Botswana and it, it boasts uh, six attorneys specializing in various areas of law and there's a staff complement of about 15. Then it goes on, he's got also under wealth management, stocks and equities, Itara, and um, this is an investment company that have focuses on investing in a couple of stocks, both in the Botswana Stock Exchange as well as the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Then he's got uh, sanitation uh, named Clean Cities and Towns, um, and this is an environment and sanitation company, which is a distributor of skip containers and portable toilets. Also got uh, under hospitality, luxury wealth in, and Kosikadi, uh, Kosikadi uh, bed and breakfast. And um, the group has invested in nine in a nine room lodge in Maung and another lodge in Surowe, and also he's into community development. So let's touch on that. This is a portfolio of about, I believe, uh, seven. Uh, Eleven companies, yeah. Yeah, uh, seven to eleven companies. Um, where did it start? Um, and has this always been the vision, or you've been moving along and identifying opportunities and getting into them? I think the way to explain this is that um, after maybe spending the first ten to fifteen years of my working life um, doing the eight to five uh, working like a, you wouldn't believe. I mean, uh, first to come in six o'clock. Last to leave 11, 12, and uh, I came to the realization that maybe this is not the best, the best way, um, because I was overweight, overworked, and, and, and a bit stressed out. So I started uh, focusing a bit more on my personal development journey, and around that time, I'm talking here, uh, early zeros, I uh, encountered a big challenge uh, in terms of a legal challenge that I had. Um, which, if uh, those who initiated it had been successful, would have resulted in the loss of my profession. Uh, I call it a cataclysmic event. It was very painful. It took two years to go through it. But uh, what happened is that uh, something very good came out of it, focused on personal development, and I came to discover that I had other interests that I could focus on. And identified as a result of getting exposed to Mr. Kiyosaki, Robert Kiyosaki, identified property as a vehicle to achieve a measure of financial freedom. Then I focused all my efforts on acquiring property. That's when I, 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 I focused on property, industrial, commercial, and then of course, uh, multi-residentials in, in Maung and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So over that decade, I were able to amass a sizable portfolio, which got to a point where um, it eclipsed the legal profession considerably, and the legal profession was no longer the source of the source of uh, income that it was initially. Um, so, as as we have focused more and more on personal development, there was a time when I was a, a bit um, uh, aggressive about it. Uh, I'd, I'd say it was personal development on steroids because I was doing two two books a week at some point. I slowed down now to about one book a, a month. So I, I, I developed an interest in learning. You know, I got to learn so much that I decided to apply some of that learning um, into other areas beyond law, beyond uh, you know, property, as, as per the, <coughs> the businesses that you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. So it was a combination of uh, uh, one or two cataclysmic events or tough events and also uh, a deliberate focus to develop uh, locally, to develop uh, personally. And there was another benefit which I didn't mention, which was to be married to a woman who was very, very strong. Mama Hobe was a, was a pillar of strength during those difficult times. And then she also developed entrepreneurial skills. She wasn't originally an entrepreneur, but she got very, very entrepreneurial. And, uh, for instance, in our sanitation business, even to this day, is run by her. Who skips dealing with those uh, 
industrial class people. She's become quite good at that. So it's a combination of factors, but largely having to do with going through these difficult times and obviously a spice of uh, uh, you know, our, uh, the faith as well came into the fore. And uh, it catapulted us to where we are today. Mm. I want to ask about your wife for a bit because mm. I'm aware that you know I'm at a point where I realize life is it's holistic. You know, it's not just business. It's not just um, mm. career. Uh, let's talk about that. Uh, how you've already said your wife was very important um, in this mm. in this process. What did you look? What did you look out for? Um, in a well, life I like program? I like what uh, what the once richest men in the in the world used to say. Jeff Bezos. I think it's either number two or number three now. I'm not sure. With the stock market going crazy in America. I think what Jeff Bezos said was that um, the focus should not be on work-life balance. It should be on work-life harmony. What that means is that balance implies, you know, uh, exact measurements or portions of, you know, this much to play, this much to work, this much to church. Everything is balanced. Harmony is, a, is an expression that I like. So that it shouldn't matter if on a particular uh, period I have to spend all the time at work because it is worth it as long as it harmoniously um, uh, intertwines with other aspects of my life. So I've been very fortunate. We've had our challenges. We still have them. But overall, it has been a, a very successful uh, partnership where she understands entrepreneurship. She understands the kind of things I'm interested in. And I understand the kind of things um, she's interested in. But it's not something that, that came by itself. We worked at it, and it developed over time. And one thing that youngsters need to realize, or people who are new in marriage, is that it doesn't, uh, it's a work in progress, and, uh, it, and it, the work doesn't stop. The work doesn't stop. It's a continuous, ongoing, and ceaseless effort to reach, uh, to reach a certain level. Mm. Even, even I'm sure, even after fifty years of marriage, when you get to that point, you will still be learning new things and still working together through, through those things. At, at, at the stage that you're in, do you still um, face challenges with um, self-esteem, confidence? I've, uh, I've, I've overcome that one. I mean, I, I do not. I'm, I'm not shy in the classical sense of the words. I'm still self-aware. I want to make sure that. I do not uh, say the wrong things in front of people, but I, I, I'm, I'm not. I don't have have self-esteem issues the way that I may have had in the early stages of my career. Uh, but as I said, it is something you have to work on. Let's take speaking, for instance. Uh, you don't learn to be a good speaker um, at the outset. It's something you have to be conscious about. You may have to join Toastmasters International. You may have to join and um, um, Sasa. Or some other organization, uh, you you need to work on improving yourself to build your confidence. Confidence doesn't come in of itself, and uh, the danger with confidence is also that there's a thin dividing line between confidence and arrogance. So you have to know when it gets to a point where it's it's arrogance. You have to know how to avoid getting to to bridge that line. Mm. Great. So I was listening to you and narrating your story. You'll correct me if the timelines are not okay, but I pick that 15 years in, in the legal space, 10 years in property. Um, is that you saying those were the focus areas in the first 25 years and then the others came? I, I would say there was a bit of an overlap. I would okay. say there was a 10 concentrated years in the legal profession and nothing else. Okay. Then there was 5 to 10 years where they overlapped. Mm -hmm. And uh, as they overlapped, there was another period when other things now came into the fore. I consciously left the law firm in terms of day-to-day -day, day -day management in 2013 when I handed over everything to my partner, my partners at the time. And uh, it is at that time that I gave my all to entrepreneurship in terms of now it being my full-time endeavor. And that's the time from 2013 to now when we experienced the biggest amount of growth in some senses, in some areas, we experience explosive, uh, explosive growth. Let's, let's talk about the art of not losing your progress, mm -hmm. because you could have easily abandoned law totally mm -hmm. and just gotten straight into into property and your other businesses. Mm -hmm. Was that an intentional decision? 
yeah, it was uh, it was something I had to wrestle with, with after building a reputation for so long and after having so many clients who depend on us. Um, I had to, to think about it and uh, I asked myself whether there are people available uh, who can be as committed, as passionate about helping my clients as I was. And I was fortunate at that time to find such people. At the moment I have Mr. Mvungama and Professor Dinoko Pida who are you know, in the front lines and who the feedback I'm getting who are giving their undivided attention to my clients in the same way. If it ever gets to a point, God forbid, where clients are complaining and the services are no longer to the level that uh, my reputation, given the importance of my reputation, to the level that my reputation de deserves, I would, I would not hesitate to formally wind, wind up the, mm. the, the law firm and perhaps have myself registered as an advocate for argument's sake and not do any, uh, any attaining work at all. Okay. So spoke about business, uh, speaking business, property, the legal firm. Let's let's touch a little bit um, on the restaurant. Um, I picked that under sanitation. I've already touched a little bit on it, mm -hmm. uh, regarding your your wife's input on it. I noticed the structure under the restaurants is, is a franchise model. Mm -hmm. um, share some insight on that. Why that approach? Yeah, I I I, um, I thought to myself my skill set when it comes to restaurants was limited. <laughs> And uh, I didn't have the energy and the wherewithal to go to all that training personally, to learn all the skills, to know all the uh, how to dot all the I's and how to cross all the T's and turn so far as the restaurant business is concerned. So what I then did is I met with existing restaurateurs, people who have an established track record. I found a, a certain Mr. Nico Piconi in Joburg, and uh, we hit it off after our first couple of meetings. And I said to him, look, how much is it going to cost for me to buy into this franchise? And what backup services are you going to, um, going to give me? I allowed for the fact that you know, the first year or two will be somewhat chaotic and we won't be making much money. So we, we are now in a phase where we're beginning to become, uh, go from the red to the black. But, uh, but, but the point I'm making is that I chose the franchise model because I didn't want... I wanted to take advantage of that fast learning curve. I realized that if I was to start from scratch with my own Mohobe uh, restaurant franchise, it's gonna, it, would, it was going to take a bit more time and it was going to require my undivided attention. With the franchise model, they have manuals, they have personnel, and then if you have the right people in place, it, uh, as, as we do at, at, at Nonas and Black, we have a good general manager and we have four managers under him and then we have systems that are in, 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 in place. I also get involved in meetings maybe once a week to try and motivate the staff and to energize them. I get so my, my involvement is very limited but it's manageable. Mm. I remember when I was still in primary school there was absolutely nothing in the CBD area mm -hmm. and I suppose those are the times when people such as yourself were buying property and eventually knew that one day you'd build um, something of that caliber. Mm -hmm. What's your vision now? Speak to that. I mean, the world is mm -hmm. talking about um, cities, smart cities, cosmopolitan cities. What's your vision for a place like yeah. um, your, your known as yeah. restaurant? Don't get me. Don't get, don't get me started. It's very exciting. I have a very exciting vision. I have a, an exciting vision of even at the CBD developing the rest of our plot. Uh, we have architects who have already come up with a model or a blueprint, and we're going through the. Uh, the approval process and the funding process. So we're going to we plan to put a 20-story uh, structure uh, along with the multi uh, multi-story development, which includes retail, which includes uh, uh, things that are not available in Botswana, sort of European style things like uh, uh, a gallery and art gallery. And I have um, I'm very excited about that, and we think that in five years the landscape will be entirely different from what it looks at the moment. Not only that, we're trying to expand Mohobe Incorporated itself. Uh, we have two divisions. We have the acquisition division, where we are actively um, seeking out multi-residential properties. We are seeking out commercial properties. We are seeking out uh, uh, industrial properties. And in key locations, the locations we've identified is Mawun, Alape, 
and Khamarani for now in the environs. So we are in a stage as we speak where we are actually acquiring and we have entered an agreement with our uh, partners in the banks where they are financing us for this development phase. The next phase, maybe in two years' time, will be the actual physical development of the CBD. So we have huge dreams for that. In terms of the restaurants, we are thinking that once uh, Nona's and Black stabilize and Khabarone, we have noticed a lot of empty malls in Palape. I'm going to start talking to the owners of those malls to see whether we can rent out space from them and maybe set up a couple of branches there. So our attitude is, is, is one of growth. Our attitude is, is both a, a mixture of uh, gradual, uh, gradual growth and exponential growth where, where circumstances justify. Mm. But growth is an imperative and we're actually in the process of scaling. All my managers have been uh, sold this dream, that the dream is to grow and to set up um, a business of, of repute where we move from a multi-million pula business to a multi-billion uh, pula business over time. That's how ambitious we are. That's how aggressive we are in terms of our outlook. Somebody might be listening to you, you spoke about art galleries, you've spoken about franchising and expanding to Palabe. Mm. How does somebody catch your attention? I mean, I imagine everything you're speaking about, that's an opportunity. Mm. How does somebody catch your attention to plug into those opportunities? It's difficult to say. I mean, a lot depends on the skill set that that person is offering. But our systems are very simple. Um, a way uh, we, yeah, we we're looking for somebody to hire, and we will you know, advertise in social media and we will go through a rigorous employment process. But otherwise, if you're looking in terms of mentorship, in terms of exchanging ideas, we've made ourselves available through Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom. We've made ourselves available through Facebook where we can interchange ideas and interact. And uh, I believe in being accessible. I mean, for instance, I can uh, readily tell you that, look, if you have something important to say, you can reach me on my WhatsApp on my WhatsApp, which, uh, which I'm not sure whether to say it now, but I mean, uh, I'm a fairly accessible sure, guy. If you look, at, if you look at the the um, the youth, the youth uh, with whom we interact, by that I mean, uh, we have uh, youth entrepreneurship organisations with whom we deal with people like uh, Founders Dinner, people uh, with Ramat Seho, people like Youth Alive with uh, your friends. Joba and uh, the other one, people like uh, um, uh, Project 124 with uh, you know, Kutzafal. We have these youth organizations who we give our time, we give our energy, and we avail ourselves to, to try and impact them, to share ideas with, and also incidentally to learn from them, mm -hmm. because we also want to have our finger on the pulse of the community in terms of what's going on at that level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've got about, I think, three minutes left. I mm -hmm. want to focus on the funding and the expansion. Uh, you just mentioned that in your expansion plans, you know, you talk to some partners, but also in collaboration with banks. Mm -hmm. What informed uh, the model of funding that you use as opposed to maybe stock markets? You know that you now you have another business that in invests in stocks in Johannesburg um, and, and, and in the Botswana Stock Exchange. I mean, you speak about this vision to move to a multi-billion dollar business. Mm. Talk, around, talk around that. First, your growth funding through banks and not the stock exchange. And do we want, will we one day see mm. Mohobe Enterprises listing on the stock exchange for that billion? That's a good question. Uh, uh, the, the advantages of listing uh, are there. Uh, but at the moment, in terms of the growth trajectory we have in mind, we've seen that in property, when we, are, when we have a certain amount of security, when you have positioned yourself the way that you have, we have, you are able to grow without necessarily going that route. Yes, some of our competitors like uh, Time Projects, like Tenstar, have chosen to list. But we have taken a much more laid-back approach where uh, we've, we've chosen not, not to go public yet. And the reason for that is that you are able to, to move, uh, to be more nimble. If you are not public, you are more nimble. You are able to take advantage of opportunities quicker as opposed to having the strict strictures of a public company. So there are advantages on both sides. For the moment, I cannot exclude the possibility of going public, but as my outlook stands in the next five to ten years, I see ourselves remaining as a private, private company. And our bankers are responding 
very positively. In fact, we are in an advantageous position where we have two or three banks uh, wanting to offer us their facilities because they realize that we have enough security, they realize that we have uh, a strong enough track record to be able to pay them. Believe me, the, the biggest interest for bankers is that are you able to pay back their money? Are they able to make money giving you money? That's all they're interested in. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much. You've just mentioned mm. the word collateral, which yeah. I think a lot of young people don't have, but also want to, at some point, find themselves doing what you're doing or surpassing you. Yes. Uh, so I, I, you said you're free to give your number. I think we're done. Mm. Maybe you can just share any last words you'd like to share, and then where can uh, anyone listening reach you? I think uh, people listening to me should know that there's been a lot of blood, sweat and tears and toil into getting to where we are. And uh, they should know that the basic, basic requisite for getting anywhere is to, uh, to be hungry. They need to have the hunger to acquire the knowledge and to absorb the wisdom. So to me, anybody who wants to learn, I'm available to mentor them. But I have a small little test. I say to you before you sit with me, I want to find out whether you are prepared. So I would normally recommend two or three books and say, go and read these books. When you've read them, let's come and talk. Half the time, some people you recommend books to, that's the last time you see them. Mm -hmm. So that's a clear indication that people are not sufficiently committed if they can't even read basic books, some of which are available, available for less than 100 pula from exclusive books. So, so anybody who's hungry, who's able to demonstrate that hunger, I'm very, very keen because if I'm able to see myself in the next generation coming up, um, I'll be more than happy to, to participate in that person's growth and that person's journey. Give me your three books before you go. Um, well, some of them are so basic. The uh, Just book, three. yeah, the book, one that I like is by Klassen. It's called uh, The Richest Man in Babylon. The other one that I like very much is by uh, Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. And then the other one, which is a classic for me in Botswana, is a book by uh, Ray David Mahan, uh, The Magic of Perseverance. If you read those three as foundational books, you, uh, it will cultivate your hunger for, for more. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to talk to you once you've read those books. <laughs> awesome. And, and uh, my contacts, um, to start with, I'm accessible on, on, on Facebook, Mamp Mohobi, that's my, my, my name. And, uh, and or on uh, YouTube, look Mohodu Nuggets of Wisdom. And also on Instagram, I'm trying to remember my Instagram. Mpulukiliruma. Yeah, it's Mpulukiliruma. <laughs> I've just been reminded yeah. what it is. Uh, so I, I've, yeah, this year I've really, I've really gotten into social media and I'm getting to like it. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Privilege and an honor for me. That was our conversation with Mr. Mpulukiliruma. I hope it was a mellow conversation as we are in festive season for you to take uh, two, one or two pointers. Thank you so much for joining us and um, join me again next week Thursday from 6 to 7.